How does an animal that looks like a crocodile, shares a broad whale like snout shape, hunts like a dinosaur killer, and wears armor like a turtle even exist? Meet Dinosuchuso reptile that combined traits from four different evolutionary worlds to become an apex predator unlike any other. Its enormous skull crushing teeth and unusual tolerance for coastal waters made it one of the strangest giants of its time. For decades, the idea that Dinosuchus was simply an oversized alligator went virtually unchallenged. At first glance, it seemed to fit. The animal had the broad body, armored back, and ambush lifestyle we still see in the American alligator today. Early fossil discoveries, mostly isolated teeth and partial skulls, were close enough in shape to alligator material that paleontologists had little reason to question the connection. The popular image stuck as well to imagine this predator. People were told to just inflate a modern alligator's body several times over. But new evidence has since forced scientists to walk back that assumption. The early classification leaned on surface level resemblance. A wide, heavy skull, thick osteoderm armor, and a semi-aquatic ambush lifestyle all gave the impression of an alligator on steroids. In the absence of extensive fossil series or molecular frameworks, that conclusion seemed reasonable. However, fossils can be misleading. Convergent evolution often produces animals that look alike while belonging to very different branches of the tree of life. By the late 20th century, as more complete remains of Dinosuchus were uncovered, researchers began noticing distinct details that did not square with its supposed place among true alligator relatives. Two features stand out in particular. First, the front of Dinosuchus's snout was inflated into a broad, bulbous shape with two small openings in the premaxilla just in front of the nostrils openings that are not seen in alligators or any other crocodilian. Second, its back teeth were short, rounded and thick, designed not for piercing and holding struggling prey, but for crushing objects with enormous force. Alligator teeth, by contrast, are sharply conical, perfect for gripping. These traits revealed that Dinosuchus was following a very different evolutionary and ecological pathway than the familiar alligator. As methods improved, the classification debate shifted to a more rigorous footing. Recent phylogenetic studies, including an expanded 2025 analysis that combined DNA from living crocodilians with a broad set of fossil taxa, reshaped the family tree. This work consistently placed Dinosuchus not inside the modern alligator lineage, but further back on an earlier stem branch of crocodilia. That reinterpretation suggests saltwater tolerance may have been present in early crocodilians and later lost in alligatorids, flipping long-held assumptions about which traits were ancient and which were newly evolved. Still, it is important to note that not every researcher agrees with this repositioning. Earlier influential analyses had continued to classify it as an alligatoroid, and the exact branching point is still debated depending on the chosen methods and data sets. To you, this might sound like narrow taxonomic bickering, but the implications are far broader. If Dinosuchus really occupied a deeper stem position, then it wasn't simply an alligator scaled up. It was a separate experiment in crocodilian evolution one that retained certain primitive features, even as it developed its own skull shape and crushing dentition. This reframes how we picture its behavior and ecology. Was its ability to handle brackish or coastal waters a brand new innovation, or did it inherit this from early crocodilian ancestors before the alligator branch lost it? Thinking of Dinosuchus this way highlights how evolutionary trials shaped the group long before the living crocodiles, alligators and gharials took their present forms. So when paleontologists argue that Dinosuchus should be placed outside the modern alligator lineage, they are not nitpicking over labels. They are acknowledging that this predator occupied a much deeper root position in the crocodilian family tree, one that reveals critical information about both ancient diversity and the origins of traits we still see today. And this reclassification brings an even bigger question into focus. If Dinosuchus was not bound to fresh water like its supposed alligator cousins, how was it able to appear on both sides of an ocean-sized barrier during the late Cretaceous? During the mid-Cretaceous, a shallow inland ocean called the Western Interior Seaway stretched from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic, splitting North America into two massive landmasses, Laramidia in the west and Appalachia in the east. 
It lasted throughout the time Dinosuchus lived, and at its widest, it reached hundreds of kilometers across. Fossils of Dinosuchus appear on both coasts of this seaway in places that would have been separated by open water for millions of years. That distribution creates the puzzle. How did a giant crocodile form manage to be present on opposite sides of a body of water that wide? In modern ecosystems, freshwater reptiles like alligators cannot tolerate prolonged saltwater exposure. Their kidneys and skin lack the mechanisms to flush out salt efficiently, so extended time in marine conditions leads to dehydration. If Dinosuchus were truly restricted in the same way, then its split fossil record becomes difficult to explain. One possibility is that separate populations evolved in isolation after North America divided, producing similar forms independently. Another is that the animals had physiological traits allowing them to cross brackish channels and saline waters when conditions permitted. Evidence for the second option has gradually built up. Today, saltwater crocodiles can cross entire seas by drifting on currents sustained by salt filtering glands in their tongues. Dinosuchus shows some cranial features that hint at similar osmoregulatory equipment. Recent phylogenetic analyses also suggest this ability may have been an ancient trait of crocodilians retained by Dinosuchus, but later lost in the lineage that led to modern alligators. Stable isotope measurements from Dinosuchus teeth support this idea too. Their chemical signatures indicate periods of marine or estuarine foraging consistent with animals occasionally ingesting salt water or consuming marine prey. Coupled with fossil finds in coastal and estuarine deposits the evidence supports at least some degree of saltwater tolerance. Still, not all researchers accept the idea of Dinosuchus as a seaway crosser. Critics point out that eastern and western fossils show long-standing differences in skull form and body size. If individuals were routinely dispersing, this genetic separation would likely have diminished over time. From that standpoint, the two populations may have been largely isolated with crossings if they happened at all being extremely rare. This interpretation suggests local populations eked out a living on each coast without constant interchange, perhaps relying on fresh water systems and only venturing into brackish zones when necessary. A compromise view frames Dinosuchus as not a fully marine reptile, but salt tolerant enough to disperse across the Western Interior Seaway on rare occasions. Much like modern saltwater crocodiles in Northern Australia, they may have hugged estuaries and coastal plains waiting for unusual conditions such as storms or lowered sea levels before striking out across open water. Even one successful crossing every few tens of thousands of years could seed a new population and explain the fossil record without demanding frequent long distance swimming. This perspective keeps Dinosuchus firmly as a river and coastal predator while also accounting for its unexpectedly wide range. If this inference is right, then Dinosuchus was not simply a scaled up alligator, but an animal with flexibility that its modern relatives no longer possess. Its dispersal ability may have been critical in giving it access to prey and territory along both sides of the ancient seaway. But dispersal alone doesn't explain why the giants of the West became so much larger than their Eastern relatives. That difference written into the bones is the next mystery. One of the most striking aspects of Dinosuchus is the size gap between populations from the western and eastern halves of North America. Fossils from Laramidia, the western landmass, include some of the largest known individuals with skulls exceeding 1.3 meters and overall length estimates in the 10 to 12 meter range, depending on how researchers reconstruct fragmentary remains. These animals likely weighed several tons and were among the largest crocodile forms to ever exist. By contrast, Fossils from Appalachia in the east are generally more modest in scale, usually less than half that length, and appear more lightly built. Instead of a consistent lineage of giants, eastern records suggest populations composed of smaller, though still formidable predators. For decades, paleontologists tried to resolve this discrepancy by splitting populations into separate species. 
The larger western fossils were commonly called D. riograndensis or D. hatcheri, while the eastern fossils were often labelled D. rugosus and more recently D. schwimmeri. This created a neat taxonomic picture on paper, large western giants versus smaller eastern cousins. But accumulating discoveries have blurred those lines. Overlapping skeletal features make it difficult to draw firm species boundaries. Increasingly, researchers suggest that environment rather than strict speciation may explain why western individuals reach such extreme sizes while eastern ones did not. The environmental contrast between these regions during the late Cretaceous was dramatic. In the west, the rise of the Rocky Mountains fed immense rivers that spilled into the western interior seaway, creating vast deltas and floodplains. These habitats were biologically rich, packed with fish turtles and dinosaurs, and capable of supporting predators that needed consistent food supplies across decades. Analyses of osteoderm growth rings show Deinosuchus didn't grow rapidly to full size. Instead, individuals experienced slow but steady growth over several decades, some perhaps more than 50 years. Such stability paired with abundant food provided the ecological foundation for true giants to emerge. Phylogenetic and paleoecological studies consistently link this pattern of slow prolonged growth with sustained gigantism to the presence of nutrient-rich aquatic ecosystems. In Appalachia, the picture was different. The smaller, less productive wetlands of the eastern landmass offered fewer and less stable food sources. Sediment supply was lower without the massive uplift of the Rockies, so broad megadeltas comparable to those in the west did not form. Under those conditions, a predator starting life with the same growth potential would struggle to accumulate decades of steady nutrition needed for gigantism. Eastern populations may have matured earlier, but at smaller sizes, shaping them into medium-sized apex predators that could dominate local ecosystems without ever reaching the enormous scale of their Western counterparts. Similar patterns are seen in other giant crocodiliforms across time species like Sarcosuchus in Africa and Purosaurus in South America only reached their colossal sizes in highly productive wetland systems. This ecological interpretation has shifted the focus away from taxonomic pigeonholes. While species names like D. rugosus and D. riograndensis still appear in the literature, many paleontologists emphasize that size and morphology may reflect environmental pressures more than hard evolutionary boundaries. In that framework, the different populations represent variations of the same lineage sculpted by the productivity of their local habitats. Gigantism, instead of being a mark of a separate species, is treated as an ecological signal, a response to long-term environmental stability and food abundance. The consequences of this size divide were significant. Larger Western Dinosuchus would have been capable of overpowering even big-bodied dinosaurs near the water's edge, while the smaller eastern forms may have specialized more heavily on turtles and mid-sized prey. Variation in body size therefore wasn't just an idle difference, it influenced diet hunting strategies and how these predators shaped their ecosystems. And to understand exactly how these crocodilian powerhouses fed, we have to look closely at their teeth and the marks they left behind. When looking at what Dinosuchus actually ate, the evidence points in a surprisingly direct direction it crushed. Unlike the sharp conical teeth of modern crocodilians, which are built for seizing and piercing Dinosuchus, had thick, blunt teeth with heavily reinforced enamel. Toward the back of the jaws, the crowns widened and flattened, forming something closer to pressure tools than puncture weapons. These adaptations were not for slicing flesh, but for cracking through the hardest materials available in its environment. The fossil record provides the clearest proof. Late Cretaceous turtle shells, some from very large marine species, show repeated circular depressions pressed deep into the carapace and plastron. These marks match the spacing and rounded profile of Dinosuchus teeth so precisely that the association is hard to dispute. Rather than neat punctures, the traces look like pits left by a vice, evidence that jaws clamped down and maintained pressure until the shell fractured. In some cases, shells preserve multiple impacts, suggesting the animal bit repeatedly on the same prey until the armor gave way. This direct correspondence between tooth shape and preserved damage makes turtles one of the most securely documented food sources for the giant reptile. Equally telling are bones from dinosaurs. In Texas, hadrosaur vertebrae have been found with large round bite impressions, consistent with Dinosuchus 
feeding. They appear as blunt indentations, not the shredding marks of a theropod's teeth. In New Jersey, a theropod limb bone shows overlapping traces where bone was not only bitten, but also crushed into fragments. These kinds of marks found both in Western and Eastern sites show that Dinosuchus did not confine itself to armored aquatic prey. It was capable of feeding on dinosaurs, though whether through active hunting at water's edge or by scavenging carcasses is still debated. Either way, its jaws were powerful enough to process even the thick limb bones of substantial terrestrial animals. Bite mechanics reinforce this picture. Scientists estimate that dinosuchus could generate a bite force significantly greater than any living crocodilian, though the exact numbers vary widely depending on the reconstruction. Some models suggest values in the tens of thousands of newtons, while others calculate far higher. But the important point is consistent. Its crushing power exceeded modern benchmarks. Combined with wear patterns on the teeth that reveal heavy contact with resistant material. The evidence indicates a feeding style fundamentally adapted to gyrophagy, the consumption of hard bony or armored prey. Behaviorally, Dinosuchus may not have been so different from modern crocodilians in how it subdued its catches. Studies suggest it might have been capable of a rolling maneuver similar to the death roll seen in extant species, but whether such a technique scaled effectively to an animal of its size remains uncertain. What is clearer is that in most situations, force rather than twisting leverage was its primary tool. Instead of tearing prey apart, it crushed turtles, dented dinosaur bones, and consumed tough foods directly. The ecological consequences were significant. By specializing in crushing dinosuchus, tapped into resources that would have been largely unavailable to other predators in its environment. In coastal and river habitats, armored turtles would have represented an abundant and dependable food source. At the same time, large size and robust jaws meant it could also exploit occasional opportunities to feed on dinosaurs, whether living or dead. This mix of specialization and opportunism allowed it to function as a true apex predator, dominant in its niche, yet flexible enough to capitalize on whatever resources appeared. Taken together, the evidence paints a clear picture. Dina Sutras was not a sleek fish catcher or a scaled up alligator, but a reptile engineered for power feeding. Its dentition bite marks on prey and jaw architecture all converge on the same conclusion. This was an animal that survived by breaking the unbreakable. And while that crushing lifestyle sustained giants for millions of years, their dependence on wetlands and estuarine habitats also tied them to environments that would eventually change beyond recognition. Dana Sutures was not just a giant alligator, it was an apex predator from an older lineage. With its broad skull and crushing teeth, it was capable of taking down even dinosaurs. However, its dependence on coastal wetlands became its fatal flaw. When these habitats shrank, the Dinosuchus went extinct around 73 million years ago, proving that even the strongest creatures can't survive environmental destruction. 